So welcome everybody, thank you for coming to uh, this uh, lecture and the um, following discussion are taking place in the framework of Sitting Together exhibition which is uh, in Transitashka, um, situated here very close at the corner of uh, Karpatka and Benzinka Street. I am uh, uh, greeting the curator of the exhibition, Zsuzsa Laszlo, who is also organizer of today's event. And um, I'm also greeting our guest, Lucy T from London, Jelena Besic from München, uh, Mira Keratova and uh, Daniel Brun from uh, Bratislava. And uh, I am asking Zsuzsa Laszlo to introduce us uh, the topic of uh, today afternoon. Welcome everyone, thanks for coming and uh, so um, these this, uh, lectures and the round table are to discuss uh, how uh, we can talk about the art of the region uh, we are part of that uh, we usually call Eastern Europe and uh, we would like to discuss uh, how exhibitions uh, with international participants can be organized and how uh, the so-called Cold War era can be revisited. And uh, uh, we wanted to address this topic from a wider perspective and uh, that's why uh, we invited Lucy Steeds from London, um, from um, the journal and uh, publishing house after all, and also from St. Martin's uh, University. And uh, I've been following uh, her activity for long, and uh, um, I think uh, it's uh, very important uh, that uh, <coughs> Lucy uh, is the editor of a book series titled Exhibition Histories, and uh, this is also the field that the project Sitting Together is uh, trying to uh, uh, connect to. So uh, that's why I asked Lucy to introduce this field uh, for us and also to give her perspective to our regional dilemmas. And she will also tell more about herself. <laughs> so, um. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, uh, for the kind invitation and for interesting dialogue in preparation for today. I also want to thank uh, Eliska for an amazing organization. Um, um, as Susa said, uh, I, I've got all my titles up here because it just seems easier to see them written down than me having to repeat them. Uh, I work for After All, which is an art research centre based at Central St Martins, which is a college within the University of the Arts London, so that's the kind of formal um, situation I come from. I work very closely on a book series called Exhibition Histories that Susa mentioned very kindly. Um, I've brought a few here that I'd be delighted to have you all to have a look at um, uh, at the end of the event. Um, and I also teach Exhibition Histories on a master's program that we run at Central St Martins, uh, a master's of research in exhibition studies. Uh, so I'm here today as a specialist in recent arts exhibition histories, which also obviously means a generalist. So my comments in this particular forum are tentative. I want to say that very clearly. I admit I've come here mostly to learn, uh, although Susan has persuaded me to start by speaking. So these are the books in the exhibition history series to date, which I have um, play a role in editing. I'm one of the editorial team. And these are the published resource that will anchor my presentation today. So each book in the series looks at a show or a cluster of shows. And when I say show, when I say exhibition, I mean very loosely understood, so in myriad forms. So for instance, the Culture in Action book, this one here, the green one, uh, there isn't really an exhibition in any conventional sense. It's a series of community-based projects. So when I say exhibition, please don't take me to assume a museum. Each of these books has a theme. So looking at the orange one down here, the theme is the, um, a movement from feminism, excuse me, from conceptualism to feminism. And the paired books to the side of it together form a, a, um, a, a pair of books that look at the theme of making art global. And it's important to us that in a way the theme comes first and the case studies come second. 
Um, and when I, I much prefer the word case study to landmark shows, we have, um, that we can't get away from the fact that there's a canon implicated when you're making books about exhibitions, it looks like you're canon building. Um, that you're sort of uh, emphasizing certain landmark shows as worthy of attention and by implication other, other ones as less worthy. So I can't pretend that there isn't a canon idea hovering over this, but I want to be very clear that when we make the books, we always try and mess with the idea of a canon. So if we're looking at a very famous show, like When Attitudes Become Form, we don't just look at that show, we don't just shore up its sort of um, canonical status. We, we looked at it in conjunction with another exhibition, this, is this book, the first in the series, uh, which involved many of the same artists, but is, oh, is much less well known. So the, the question posed in the book is why is one so famous and one not so famous? Um, questioning the canon is very much part of the series. Again, with the books here, Making Art Global, the pair of books I mentioned, one of these books is looking at Magician de la Terre, which is often cited as a landmark show, either a positive or negative landmark, but a landmark nonetheless. And we, rather than just give airtime to that one exhibition, we paired it with another, which is much uh, less well known, or certainly was at the time that we made the books, and that's the Havana Biennale of 1989. So the same year as Magician de la Terre, two books from the same year, two exhibitions from the same year, but looking at them together. So trying to complicate um, uh, tired notions of canonization. Um, one more thing I want to say about the books in general is that they're multivocal. So there are archival texts in these books, there are also newly commissioned texts. We involve, we give some space to the curatorial voice, uh, we give uh, space to artist voices and we uh, crucially, I think, involve independent critical thinkers. Uh, and the image section of the books is in itself uh, a project uh, that changes depending on what exhibition we're looking at. So that's the book series, that's the kind of the basis from which I, the sort of body of knowledge from which I'll be speaking today. Um, but I just want to flag that Susan kindly mentioned that we also produce a journal after all, uh, there's a journal called After All, this is where After All started, we started with a journal. And we, the exhibition histories as a sort of strand of concern for After All is also um, uh, connected to the journal. So many essays are published there um, that's uh, testing the waters for what might become a book later. So for instance, um, this is an essay uh, from the journal that's also available online and it's looking at the Chiang Mai social installation um, which is a, a performance festival in the mid-90s uh, in northern Thailand and we're beginning to think about a book about this so we start, for instance, by commissioning this essay. Uh, the books also emerge out of public events so this is a public event that uh, contextualised that essay it took place in Melbourne and it took, had the title, you can read it here, Regions of the Contemporary Transnational Art Festivals and Exhibitions in 1990s Southeast Asia. And this is a pattern you'll see I come back to where we have a public event in order to have, um, to, to try out potential commissioning ideas uh, with a public audience. Um, we also, this is the, sorry, this is a snap from the After All website and I want to flag some other things that have exhibition histories as their theme within um, after all's output, which don't necessarily end up in a book, so well, they complement the books. This is one talk, uh, we have a, a strand of exhibition histories talks at, at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, and this is one conversation where I'm talking about Cities on the Move, which is an Asian showcase exhibition we could come back to if you want to talk about regional showcase exhibitions. Um, and this is another talk in the same series, uh, my colleague Lena Elagard talking to about Curlin from Vey Have. Um, so that's the background, really. That's just a sort of frame um, where I'm coming from. Okay, we're there. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I should have checked that the uh, slides were as I wanted before I started. This list represents a summary of the brief or the remit that Sousa gave me for my presentation today. She asked me to one, introduce the discipline of exhibition history as such, two, to discuss the dilemmas and challenges of creating international or transnational 
narratives. So I mean, probably the challenges of creating international or transnational narratives. And three, to address how East European art scenes are positioned. So you'll be glad to know I've been very obedient. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each of these, and it will all be anchored in the work that I've just set out for after all. I'm going to mostly read from a prepared paper with a little, little bits of improvisation from notes. Um, I have a tendency to speak too fast, so please jump in or wave at me if that happens, um, or ask me if anything is unclear. For me, Exhibition histories means studying art in a past moment and specifically privileging the moment in which art engages with a public or with diverse publics, mobilizing effective debate. It means asking how particular art presented in a particular way has changed how we see, think, talk, behave, act. If you've listened very closely and if you're an editorial pedant with words like I am, then you may have spotted that I have here changed my brief or remit from history in the singular to histories in the plural. I want to talk today about exhibition histories, plural, not exhibition history, singular. History always means histories, of course. It is multivocal and disputed. But somehow the event of an exhibition, its outward facing, disparately engaging, haptic and experiential characteristics, these things demand we think about diverse accounts of the same thing. Hence my insistence on histories, plural, here today. And hence the fact that all the books in After All's Exhibition History series are anthologies, uniting diverse perspectives. Actually, when speaking in Rio de Janeiro last year, I was delighted that the expression exhibition histories was conveyed as histories of exhibitions in Portuguese by the translator, with exhibitions in the plural as well as histories being pluralized. Mm -hmm. Delighted because in that way the exhibitions we focus on, their necessary multiplicity, is emphasized, which I like very much. It suggests that we must always be open to consider another different case study, rather than just sticking with the one exhibition that we know. And if you'll forgive me, Susan, I want to make another pedantic editorial point, one that has, again, implications that I care about. This is a, an open question. Does the distinction between field and discipline, so field of inquiry on the one hand and academic discipline on the other, does that translate into Slovak? Is that, okay. I have to say I feel passionately about exhibition histories as a field rather than a discipline. This is quite simply because there are no fixed rules of conduct. And after all, we try to rethink what exhibition histories might be every time we make a book, or indeed when we make a website, as we're currently doing for one particular exhibition, which I'll come on to in a bit. I've also personally worked in the field of exhibition histories through curating film screenings and through juxtaposing film footage and musical recordings. My point here is partly that when written and published, exhibition histories takes on myriad forms and perhaps rather that it must if it's to do justice to the complexity of an exhibition event, to the diverse experiential and discursive realities provokes. And at the same time, my point is partly that exhibition histories need not only be written and published, but may also be staged in diverse museological and other exhibition contexts, as we can see from sitting together, um, or indeed in moments of the Ulius Kuller exhibition in Vienna. And I've only just seen both those shows in the last couple of days, so before drafting my paper, so my understanding of still, is, is still raw, and it's not reflected in what I'm presenting, so I just um, set that up as a, an apology in advance. By advocating for exhibition histories, in particular as a field of inquiry, I am actively countering the related rise of curatorial studies. There are overlaps between exhibition histories and curatorial studies, for sure, but I want to insist on the difference of emphasis. I want our focus to be on art in the public moment and not on the agency, or more often not, the curatorial personage who claims responsibility for making that art public. I'm afraid that curatorial studies all too frequently slips into curatorial hagiography with an affirmation of the career trajectories of a few quasi-canonized curators eclipsing any critical examination of how art operates and what it changes. It is this critical examination that I care about and seek to advocate through exhibition histories. 
But that critical examination is distinct from art history, which has a disciplinarity, a long-standing European to North American tradition that I believe needs destabilizing. In past writings, I've characterized this attempt to destabilize art history by drawing on the notion of minor literature proposed by French philosophers Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari in their 1975 celebration of the writings of Franz Kafka. And I'm going to read one thing that I've written about this. So. Kafka is hailed by Deleuze and Guattari for the way in which he uses the German language. As a Prague-born Jew who chose not to publish in Czech or Hebrew, Kafka is celebrated by Deleuze and Guattari for making strange and subverting, their word is deterritorializing, the German language. He is affirmed by them for thereby issuing a political program and a collective utterance. This, for them, is the strength of what they call a minor literature. And among the more direct summary statements they offer is the following, quote, A minor literature is not the literature of a minor language, but the literature a minority makes in a major language, end quote. In my experience, when writing exhibition histories most effectively, it is not primarily art history that curators, artists, and other non-historians produce. For instance, I want to point you towards the core essay in the book and afterwards exhibition history series that takes the 24th Biennale de Sao Paulo, the Brazilian biennial curated in 1998 by Paulo Herkenhan as its focus. This is one of the books I've brought along if you want to have a look at it later. This is a book that might as well have been titled Making Art Global Part 3. But in the end, we published it with, a, with the title Cultural Anthropophagy, which takes its lead directly from the biennial <coughs> exhibition itself, where anthropophagy or cannibalism was the model proposed for international or transnational cultural exchange, rather than ecumenical multiculturalism. The core essay in this after all book was written by curator Lisette Lagnado, who, who co-edited the book with my erstwhile colleague, Pablo La Fuente. In her essay, Lisette explained the key curatorial influence of a notion borrowed from François Lyotard, specifically that of épaiseur, so it's a French term, épaiseur. This is a quality that might be paraphrased as a density loaded with silent meaning. But Lisette didn't just explain this, she also, when describing the installation of the show, put this very concept to work in her prose. The crux of her historical project was to reinvigorate in text what she had perceived to be significant when visiting experientially the Biennale exhibitions of 1998. So it's a big issue for us when we're commissioning authors to write books for the series or essays for books in the series. Who do you go to? There isn't an established um, uh, cadre of people who call themselves exhibition historians or writers of exhibition histories. Often we commission curators like Lisette who write beautifully about how art works with the public, how art interrelates to other, pe other pieces of art and has a dialogue with those visiting. But they're not necessarily very good at writing history. Or we might commission an art historian and then you have the opposite problem. You get a really confident historical survey. But you don't necessarily get that um, sensibility, sensitivity to what it is to, to make art public, to put art, uh, to juxtapose works of art. Let's take another example in the writing of exhibition histories, this time involving neither a curator nor an art historian in the role of author, but instead an artist. I've also brought this book along if you want to have a look. I want to flag the text by artist Martin Beck in this book in After All's exhibition history series, which takes an exhibit, the 1957 installation in the UK, by artists Richard Hamilton and Victor Passmore, with the involvement of the critic Lawrence Alloway as its focus. The title of the book, as I hope you can see, is Exhibition Design Participation, and the subtitle, An Exhibit, 1957 and Related Projects. Here, in his essay, Martin deals with the fact that he knows an exhibit best through a succession of recreations or restagings, addressing these attempts to remount the project as so many ghosts to be probed and questioned. The historical task he sets himself is precisely the channeling of diverse related spirits or dispossessed souls. 
mediation in the spiritualist sense, if you like. So these are just a couple of examples of how this project from 1957 has been restaged more recently. And this is what, this is how Martin Beck engaged with an exhibit through channeling these restagings. From the keyboards of curator Lizette Lagnado and artist Martin Beck, the minor mode, which after Deleuze and Guattari is what we might call exhibition histories, rears its head in the registers of art history, destabilizing the language of this dominant or major discipline. The prose by Lagnado and Beck does not immediately read as art history. It does not obviously bear the hallmarks of the different established schools of art historical thought. Yet it works away at and complicates the writing in that more established field. More generally, I see exhibition histories as a minor literature relative to the major literature of art history because in the way we produced it after all, we strive to meet Deleuze and Guattari's two criteria. First, by having a political program, and second, by issuing a collective utterance. To elaborate, the thrust of our political program is the decentralization of all art worlds, whether these be anchored in Paris, New York, London, Beijing, or Abu Dhabi, which is also to insist on demarketization. Secondly, and relatedly, comes our commitment to collective utterance. This is somewhat literally manifest in the sense that we are an editorial collective at After All. And moreover, each of our books is now edited in conjunction with the lead author, who sits outside of the, editor, of the After All Editorial Collective, but who is invited in for the purposes of making a particular book in the series. So as I've already described, is that Lagnardo played this outside, inside editorial role for the book we produced on the Anthropophagia Beat Biennial in Sao Paulo in 1998. And incidentally, she wrote her essay in her own language in Brazilian Portuguese, and we had it translated for the purposes of publication. It is deeply problematic, of course, that we have not yet found a Brazilian partner to publish the book in Portuguese. So that essay that she wrote only exists in English. I would like to claim that we are, also, after all, is also committed to collective utterance in the field of exhibition histories in the sense that we try to support other voices in the field beyond our own and beyond those whom we bring in to work with us. So this is just a little example of a book launch that we did. When we launched the Sao Paulo book, we paired it with another book that we had nothing to do with, uh, just in order to sort of showcase, other, to give a platform to other um, publishers in the field, other work in the field. As you may remember from my title slide and introductory remarks, I'm involved in a course for master's students doing research and exhibition studies. And having resources to recommend to them beyond what we produce at After All is absolutely vital. Here's Suzo, your online exhibition archive for Eastern Art, Eastern European Art Events, your parallel chronologies project for transit is a crucial point of reference. And I'm delighted that After All was able to fund a student on the course to attend um, the curatorial dictionary event in Budapest in 2015. Other crucial voices in the exhibition histories field include Asia Art Archive, who have an amazing library of exhibition catalogues and other ephemera, all for consultation in their Hong Kong space. But Asia Art Archive also have a remarkable digitization project and make valuable resources available online. I believe there's a mutual respect and support between all these voices in the exhibition histories field, a differentiated collectivity of utterance. Before leaving the topic of exhibition histories as such, I want to take a moment to reflect back on the short life of this young field to date. And I hope if you, you will forgive me if this is going to hit a very anecdotal and personal note. I'm going to try and make my arguments, I'm going to extract arguments, although you might see them more clearly than I can. When I first gave an invited lecture under the banner of exhibition histories, but without flying the After All flag, so speaking not of my editorial work for After All, but of my own independent research in the field, it was in fact under the auspices of Asia Art Archive and in Hong Kong. This is back in October 2013, so three and a half years ago, when there were just three books in After All's exhibition histories series. The whole premise of this particular conference in Hong Kong was the centrality of exhibitions to the making of recent art history in Asia. And in conversation with my co-presenters and with participants, I found myself constantly having to defend exhibition histories as a field in itself, rather than as an alternative means by which to do art history. 
And I have to say, I consistently lost this battle. Nobody was interested in exhibition histories as such, only in art history as it might be written via the exhibition. And here I would point you towards Bruce Altshuler's long-standing and well-earned position as a pioneer of this earlier take on the field. His take not actually being exhibition history such as I've set it out myself this afternoon, but rather being the history, and here history is in the singular, he writes himself, and only he speaks from his own position, the history of exhibitions that made our history. That's what, that's what his project is. And you can see that in the subtitle to his most recent books. They're paired volumes, and they each document exhibitions that made our history. So that's the, the first moment I want to reflect on, the sort of 2013 moment when I was having to sort of constantly ex defend exhibition histories from um, being more than just uh, reinforcing art history. Next, I want to fast forward us to the summer of 2014, where I had a deeply frustrating exchange of letters with Claire Bishop in the pages of Art Forum in the United States over what exhibition histories might or might not be. Actually, if we had debated the field, it might have been interesting. My frustration lies in the fact that she didn't take this nearly as seriously as she might, distracting us with entertainingly sharp words while failing to engage with my challenge to her relegation of exhibition histories to the status of mere art historical subgenre. And that's a direct quote from, quote from Claire's original text for Art Forum. She describes exhibition histories as an art historical subgenre, which if we were following Bruce Altshuler's lead, rather than the position I've set out for you, it arguably would just be. To add then, my own turn to Deleuze and Guattari's notion of a minor literature, such as I've just set it out, was largely in order to contest the pejorative sub of subgenre as imposed by Claire and to recharge it with the distinctive power that Deleuze and Guattari attribute to so-called minority status via Kafka. Finally then, the last moment in the sort of history of exhibition histories that I want to bring up um, is a and it catches us up with um, my reflections on the field. Uh, these take us back to a symposium that Yelena and I both took part in at the end of January in Oslo. Two years on from the US verdict of art historical subgenre, a whole symposium was convened by two distinguished German academics in Norway in order to put into question the current canonization and academicization of the historical writing on and referencing of exhibitions. And there I'm quoting from the organisers, Beatrice von Bismarck and Rika Fang from the event literature. That was their ambition, to question current canonisation, academicization of the historical writing on and referencing of exhibitions. I hope what I've told you so far about Arthur's Exhibition Histories books goes at least some way towards explaining why I don't believe we fall into the paired pits of canonisation and academicization although we sometimes consider shows that are certainly hailed as canonical in rather tired circles, and although our books are certainly produced in an academic context and often, but not always, carry the baggage of, for instance, extensive footnotes. So let me share the particular joy of this event in Oslo for me, which came when a member of the audience made a comment in passing that completely turned on its head Claire Bishop's categorization of exhibition histories as an art historical subgenre. This spontaneous contributor said, as if it was consensual in the room and indicative of all serious debate of art more broadly, that art history was clearly a subgenre of exhibition histories. All I can say is, wow, how far the field has expanded in a short while. And what I have to ask now in response is, what happens when minor becomes major? And that's the question I have to leave hanging, because I don't have a ready answer. Here comes part two, and this is where I'm going to attempt to address the dilemmas and challenges of creating international and transnational narratives. In 2009, after all convened a symposium at Tate Britain in London, in conjunction with another research centre at the University of the Arts London, like after all, but known as TRAIN, this is an acronym for Transnational Art, Identity and Nation. This symposium took place under the title Exhibitions and the World at Large, 
which picked up on the title of a conversation between Londoner Charles Harrison and New Yorker Seth Sigalab, published in 1969, picking up on that northern transatlantic dialogue in order to posit other so-called worlds at large 20 years later in 1989. This symposium was a staging post towards the paired books in the Exhibition History series that share the title of Making Art Global. So these are the books I've already mentioned. They came out in 2011 and 2013, respectively. For both the 1989 shows covered by these books, an invocation lay, an innovation, excuse me, lay in thinking transnationally rather than internationally. This meant challenging the Venice Biennale model of international delegation, which relied on the richest or most invested nation states choosing which artist or artists to represent them. And it meant a shift towards a curator or curatorial team selecting for themselves who they deemed to be most interesting from around the world, independent of national advocacy and of international diplomatic relations. In part presaging the final section of my presentation today, let us look at the representation of East European artists within these major exhibitions in order to reflect on the international and or transnational narratives in play. How many of you know the Magician de la Terre exhibition? Have heard it discussed or... Okay. Magician de la Terre took place in Paris and proclaimed itself to be the first worldwide exhibition of contemporary art. That was the slogan that was used by, in the publicity department. Showcasing the work of approximately 100 artists, half were said to be Western and half non-Western, although no one was announced as either one nor the other. Each artist was asked to declare their place of birth and place of work, or indeed places of work, plural, and here cities and also villages ruled over nation states. The curators had decidedly fixed ideas of what constituted contemporary art from different parts of the world, but they had relatively scant regard for national schools, in particular when it came to recent practice unfamiliar in the art world anchored in Paris and New York. Beyond emigres to West Europe and North America, namely Serbians or Yugoslavians, Marina Abramovic and Brako Dmitrievic, and from Poland, Krzysztof Rodisko, and beyond the so-called dissident artists from Moscow, namely Ilya Kabakov and Eric Bulatov, there was only one East European artist included in Magician de la Terre, Karol Malich from Prague. Malik didn't make it to Paris for the exhibition installation, and this is notable given that se about 70 of the 100 artists were brought to Paris in the run-up to the show with assistance and translators as needed. For the sake of argument here today, we should compare the artists and magicians hailing from West Europe, no fewer than 25, or a quarter of the whole exhibition with eight different nationalities represented, albeit implicitly rather than explicitly, explicitly since nationhood was de-emphasized. In other words, as I wrote in the After, after All book back in 2013, the so-called Iron Curtain, or the Cold War ba barrier represented by the Berlin Wall, which would fall later that year, the Iron Curtain still loomed large. And to develop this into a reflection on transnationalism and internationalism, we might say that the global vision of art promulgated in Magician de la Terre in 1989 exposed a marked ignorance of continentally proximate art scenes, with Cold War international politics, however exhausted by this point, acting to discourage transnational cultural knowledge or inquiry. We're now going to shift to Havana to consider the third Art Biennale of 1989, which as you can see here was the focus for the first of the two volumes we published under the Making Art Global uh, title. And I can tell you right away that no East European artists were included. But then if you look at the catalogue, no West European artists are strictly represented either. The Biennale catalogue specifies that participation in the exhibition was only open to African, Asian, Caribbean and Latin American artists, which might make it seem explicitly non-global until you read the concluding clause, which is whether resident in their country or not. 
This is being described, excuse me, this is elaborated in the following line of the published regulations, where the Biennale is described as being open to artists belonging to ethno-cultural groups of the above origins, that is African, Asian, Caribbean, Latin American descent, but based in other countries. In other words, the organizers declared a particular geopolitical take on the world, one we might now choose to describe as concerned with the global south, while simultaneously acknowledging global migration and the representation of the global south within the rest of the world. This all sounds highly transnational, thoughtfully local and regional and global, although in reality things were somewhat more complicated. As Rachel Weiss writes with considerable authority in the after all book, quote, the Biennale was indissolubly linked to the Cuban state, and so participation or non-participation remained a matter of formal international relations, end quote. International relations and cultural diplomacy turns out to have made it possible for a handful of UK-based artists from Africa, Asia or the Caribbean, or British artists with parents from these places, to contribute to the Havana Biennale of 1989. As organised by artist Shahi Morali and funded by the British Council, works by himself and four other artists made it into the Central Biennale show, if not into the associated catalogue. I've seen the inclusion of these artists was confirmed too late for the publication's print deadlines. For me, these works make a profoundly European contribution to the show, one that precisely questions European values by firmly bolting the notion of colonialism onto that of modernism. So this is the work of one of those black British artists in Havana. It's Keith, Keith Piper's work, Recycling Liberty. It's a massive banner. You can see the doors into the space here. And these are very high doors. I think head height's only around here. So it's a, a vast banner pinned up high on the wall. Um, and you can see the title is Recycling Liberty. It's an image of the Statue of Liberty, which, as I'm sure you know, was moved from Paris to New York. Um, but here that... Uh, uh, movement from Paris to New York is inflected by an um, uh, Afro-American take on that. And of course, uh, we might remember Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité as the sort of French um, uh, Enlightenment values. And uh, we might also note the lack of any anti-colonial work in Magician de la Terre. Keith Piper and the work of the British or Britain-based artists who gathered together under the banner of Black Art in the 1980s provides a link to the third show that we debated at the 2009 symposium with which I started this section of my talk on internationalism and transnationalism. During our symposium, Exhibitions in the World at Large, we compared not only Magician de la Terre in Paris with the third Cuban Biennale in Havana, but also another show from the same year which took place in London. This was expressly a show about art made in a single nation, in Britain. Yet internationalism and transnationalism pervaded that nationalism, since all of the artists represented in the show were described as Afro-Asian. This exhibition was called The Other Story, subtitled Afro-Asian Artists in Post-War Britain, and it was curated by artist Rashid Arain for the Hayward Gallery in London as a direct challenge to the racist white British establishment proposing a rich and diverse narrative of British art almost entirely neglected, if not denigrated, by national collecting, art history and art criticism at the time. Back in 2009, I admit that I found the other story too nationally focused and too art historical to prompt a book in the Exhibition History series. The excellent paper that Jean Fisher gave on the subject of the exhibition was very swiftly published online by Tate, and I felt that Magician and the Havana Biennale were the shows that urgently begged more detailed study and analysis, analysis through books in our series. Now, however, eight years later, and in the midst of the racist fears that have bizarrely prompted the UK to leave the European Union, I feel the significance of the other story is greater now than ever. 
So this is a snapshot back to the After website. I'm sorry if this seems like constant publicity. It's just a resource for my materials. Um, this is a microsite that we've dedicated to the other story, this London exhibition from 89, that we're in the process of working on. This is absolutely a working document you're looking at. You won't be able to find this if you look now, because we haven't gone live yet. So we're um, essentially in embedding installation shots of the show in a website. and. A um, we will be publishing audio tours of the exhibition. The first one will be written by a couple of my students. The point at this stage in my paper is simply that diasporic and migrational understanding of transnationalism, an understanding that throws us back into issues of nationalist might and cultural rhetoric, now feels urgent. Indeed, in the UK, where I am based, impossible to ignore. I have one further point I want to make in relation to the dilemmas and challenges of creating international or transnational narratives in the field of exhibition histories. This takes us rather far away from the UK and indeed from Europe. It takes us to the diverse grouping of nations in Southeast Asia. But I want to go there just briefly in search of parallels that I hope might be pertinent to the final section of my paper and the specific frame of the event that brings us together. The frame of how we might meaningfully talk about East European art. As I've already flagged in my introduction, we are currently working um, on a new book in the Exhibition History series. We're working with David Tay, who's based in Singapore, and he's going to be the lead author. He's like the co-editor of this book. It's due out next year, and it's emerging from that Melbourne conference. Actually, I think I've got to repeat it. It's emerging from this Melbourne conference that I've already mentioned. Um, looking at uh, contemporaneity across transnational art festivals and exhibitions in the 1990s in Southeast Asia. This event involved bringing together diverse national art specialists whose research focus is more or less comfortably united as Southeast Asian. So Pamela Corey spoke about art scenes in Vietnam and Cambodia, Grace Sambo about Indonesia, Patrick Flores about the Philippines, and Grithia Gawiwon about Thailand, for example. One of our baseline questions centered on what has in fact, what has in fact united art and exhibition practices across the region. And where do national differences or international or transnational relationships outside the region override regional generalisation? I say baseline for our questioning because we are far from the first to raise these issues, of course. And interesting essays on the very top topic of spurious regionalisation already are already in the public domain. Pamela Corey, for instance, used the paper she presented at Asia Art Archive, the symposium I've already mentioned in Hong Kong in 2013 to pose a crucial attendant question, asking for whom and how are the local and regional histories being written. Of course, this echoes the titular directive of Veha Ve, what, how, and for whom, and um, it probably seems simplistic, but it's totally essential when you're a publisher to think of what, how, and for whom. When it comes to After All's Exhibition History series, the answer is different with every book. I can only hope, then, that we sustain our readers over the course of the series, that our French readers of the Magician book also read about Havana, for instance, and that the readers of both books were engaged by the more recent Biennale de Sao Paulo book, Cultural Anthropophagy, which, as I've already flagged, might also have taken the title Making Art Global Part Three. I'm afraid my own research into Southeast Asian transnationalisms is still too nascent to offer any more concrete material for discussion today. But, I mean, just as a, an aside, I would be happy to share references. Um, I was belatedly thinking, having scripted this paper, that it would have been nice just to bring some, es some of those essays and we could maybe have done a, read a w uh, discussion group. But maybe I'll just leave it with uh, some references to pass on if you're interested. So here we are at the third and final part of my presentation. Although I've somewhat overshot already and started to flag some rather loose thoughts on the positioning of East European art. To conclude my formal contribution to today's event, I want to just set out the two after all initiatives that have, under the Exhibition Histories banner, addressed or are currently addressing East European art. First, however, I need to note that in the two Exhibition Histories books that we published to date on shows in the late 1960s and early 70s, shows that have rethought how exhibition space might be activated, no East European artists featured. There was no East European conceptual art, for instance, in When Attitudes Become Form in Bern, and none in Oplosche Schrover in Amsterdam. 
These were the paired case studies for the first book in the Exhibition History series. And both were European shows that apparently felt radically, and international, radically international, simply for including West European and North American artists. And the same may be said of Lucy Lippard's so-called numbers shows of the same era, which were the case studies for the third book in the Exhibition History series. Nevertheless, I want to know that these two books in our series emerged from broader discussions where there was live debate about comparable Eastern European case studies. Prior to last year's Regions of the Contemporary Conference in Melbourne, and also to our 2009 Symposium in London, Exhibitions in the World at Large, these two books were formed and informed by an event we staged in Vienna in 2008, where Powell Pollitt spoke about the Foxhall Gallery in Warsaw in the period 1966 to 1972, for instance, and Rachel Weiss addressed the overarching problematics of so-called global conceptualism. Powell Pollitt's contribution to this event was later elaborated as an essay for After All Journal, and just as importantly, I want to note that our research into this historical moment across distinct geographies, like our research into the other story after the exhibitions and the World at Large event, is not over, but steadily ongoing. Recently, I have learned a lot, for example, from Yoko Watanabe's work into Between Man and Matter, the major show curated by Yusaki Nakahara for the 10th Tokyo Biennale in 1970 a show that united not only many of the same artists as When Attitudes Become Form and Not Plusha Shova and Lucy Lippard's number shows, the shows covered by these uh, two after all books and exhibition history series, but also Japanese artists and, for instance, Edward Krasinski from Poland and Stanislav Kolabal, Kolibal from Czechoslovakia. And, of course, over the last two days, I have learned a lot about uh, Ulias Kula's work and all the events remembered in the Sitting Together project. Where all this learning will lead is still yet to be determined. I am constantly reassured that there will always be more books in the Exhibition History series to make. Beyond Pal Pollitt's essay for After All Journal on an Exhibition Histories tip and with a Polish focus, our most obvious initiative that may be encompassed within Eastern European positions is our latest book, which we're currently working on and is due out in the summer of this year. So this book is titled Anti-Shows and it looks up the Aptart projects from 82 to 84 in Moscow. Uh, it's edited by David Morris, who's an in-house colleague of mine at After All, and the two external um, uh, authors and contributing editors are Margaret Rita Tipitson and Victor Tipitson. Two of the participants in Aptart wrote a kind of press relief for their first anti-show, which took place in 1982. It reads, quote, this event is not an exhibition, and certainly not a private showing. It is an artist's apartment where his friends have gathered to do a collaborative work, and those who are gathered are in no way a unified group. Here, all models and conceptions are re-evaluated, re but this is not analysis in the usual sense. It is above all action, creative realization, end quote. In this narration, we might note a break with earlier, comparatively earnest, discursive and documentation-heavy projects familiar in Moscow, such as those of the Collective Actions Group. Aptart saw itself as the new wave, as, the, as partial to trash aesthetics and an anarchic performativity. That gives you some art historical pointers, but what about the exhibition histories? The Aptart programme of anti-shows was both, was both individualised and collective, not public, but not private, part of life, but defiantly art. The paradoxes are manifold, manifold and defy many familiar binaries. I'm guessing the question will arise, why look at these anti-shows, these apartment projects in particular now? So let me try and answer that by way of concluding my presentation today. With the benefit of hindsight, Aptart can be said to coincide with the beginning of the end of the USSR. Post Brezhnev and pre Gorbachev, it was specifically concurrent with the two year tenure of Yuri Andropov, the former KGB chief who was infamous, of course, for his leading role in the violent suppression of the Hungarian Revolution and Prague Spring. Nevertheless, a sense of things ending, of other things starting, was not perceptible in Moscow at this time. 
in the early to mid 80s, the system in place seemed, still seemed incontrovertible. David Morris, my colleague who's co-editing this book for After All, um, has kindly shared with me his draft essay which will ultimately open this book. Here he describes Aptart at one point like this. Quote, the aim was not to contest the system, only to exist alongside it or outside it. End quote. He cites Nikita Alexiev, an artist involved in the project and also the person who lived in the Aptart apartment, as describing the initiative's importance as lying in an escape from dominant con conditions providing, quote, a small space where we could work and function and communicate a parallel world, end quote. I have to say there seems to be a decided lack of interest in Moscow in Aptart now. I assume because it looks like the last gasp of, a, of the Soviet era, rather than the demonstration of hope against hope that I personally see in it now. An example for how to cope with the apparently incontrovertible system of global capitalism that we now find ourselves confronting, perhaps. A glimmer of the possibility to create a parallel world where a group, however small, can work and function and communicate meaningfully. Thank you. That's everything I have to say. Independence and self-organization, 
uh, which uh, are both uh, concepts uh, very often associated with uh, the Cold War period and East European art, and she will unpack those many layers that uh, this concept has, and what is also very important for us that uh, she will connect them to our present situation, which. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's always very important uh, working with histories uh, and uh, memories uh, of, of art events to, to, to expose why we are doing this and how we connect to them personally or, or as, as uh, managers or creators of, of a project. So if uh, yeah. there's no technical uh, problem. Yeah, okay, let's see, let's see first if the, if the, if the technical, uh, technical aspect uh, works. In the meantime, uh, maybe just to, uh, to connect uh, with, uh, uh, with your introduction and uh, uh, to uh, add uh, the things that are maybe in the back in the background of uh, of, of the talk uh, for for this occasion, uh, it is uh, that uh, actually <laughs> experiencing uh, contemporaneity, which is uh, very much uh, about inclusion and about being represented and about the representation of the world. Uh, and now, especially, I mean, working uh, in the place which is one of the uh, leading uh, as uh, uh, those interested in power would uh, formulate the institutions, so which is uh, which is House de Gusta, which is precisely dealing with the notion and the idea of global. I would like to point this aspect that it is always about the representation and that normally, I mean, those who are in power to, uh, uh, to actually produce uh, and show global art will talk about the representation. So who is in and who is, I mean, who is in? I mean, the more uh, are in, the more global exhibition is, but actually uh, the, the the real uh, question of uh, uh, of colonial or of colonizing would be who is in a position to be the uh, interface uh, for this representation. So it is uh, not only about uh, uh, being represented. I mean, as Eastern European African. Uh, I don't know whichever otherness uh, margin we might think of, but it's very much about with whom you share your powerful tool, your powerful interface when it comes to the question of mediation. Because this is, uh, this is what is actually uh, what is actually important. Who is in the power to speak about uh, to speak about global things and actually um, uh, uh, my paper my paper is based on a, like a long lasting research re resulting in a smaller uh, text essays and uh, public and publications uh, which were dealing with uh, this issue of representation of uh, uh, Eastern Europe uh, or Eastern European art within a global context, and the global context, which is also referred to as post-colonial, but not less importantly post-communist. Eh? The third term, post-communist, uh, is something that I uh, dealt with uh, very much, uh, observing it as also, you know, like not merely a chronological term, which uh, describes a certain uh, uh, period of uh, art and intellectual production, but rather as a term which is ideological. And uh, this is uh, also part of uh, the collective labor that uh, I was doing uh, together with a group of um, theorists, art historians, architects, political theorists, sociologists, philosophers, as being part of uh, uh, 
of travel journal uh, whose origin is uh, theoretically speaking uh, Autosarian Macania. Okay. So, so actually, the, the issue I'm dealing with, uh, I'm dealing with here, is uh, 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 rather how that, in in relation to the question of representation, is not who is represented, but how is represented. And of course, I'm speaking about the subjectivities of uh, of uh, uh, Eastern Eastern Europe, and. Uh, uh, it's maybe also important to uh, point to uh, some connections. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I participated, as Zhuzha said, as Zhuzha said, I participated as uh, one of the uh, archivists, <laughs> uh, like uh, okay, like maybe proactive archivist in uh, the uh, archive uh, or uh, exhibition history. Uh, website uh, called Parallel Chronologies, uh, but now uh, I was also uh, trying to observe. Uh, shall I, uh -huh, we have a mic. This better. Yeah, but okay. I was uh, now trying to to, to 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 observe and to reflect on what's. Uh, 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 the, 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 the entire archive and actually uh, this is uh, this talk is also one of the attempts to use it as a resource another thing uh, where I would also like to 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 to, uh, to credit uh, a journal like a new uh, web journal uh, the journal of uh, mesosphere, mesosphere. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the editors, Esther, is uh, uh, today uh, with us, who uh, were uh, discussing the notion of uh, independence in the last uh, in, the, in the last issue. And uh, part of my uh, talk will, will be connected to to that because I was uh, also invited to be one of the uh, respondents. Okay, persistence of independent culture in the East and the internal contradictions of contemporary independence. <laughs> I'm actually, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the life, the life of art uh, and art and life and uh, networking and searching and uh, researching, etc., is not merely the question of. Uh, uh, geographical location in the area of Eastern Europe, but uh, that actually these uh, conditions are uh, contemporary conditions are shared, though different. So, uh, in uh, part of these uh, contemporary conditions uh, is uh, that uh, more and more we uh, are uh, around a team of self-organization. So the, the, the team of self-organization acquired wi wide currency in contemporary art circles, which is, of course, very much connected with the network cultures, with also absorption of institutional critiques, and uh, all these aspects created the moment where crit critical practitioners more and more talk about producing new culture through cooperation and sharing platforms and networks, through working outside of isolated and traditional state-run institutions and their representative and repressive political functions. And uh, we also uh, face this kind of uh, proliferation of different declarations uh, um, witnessing the value of self-organization from the so-called independent cultural actors, regardless their actual ma material ties to institutions and of culture and governance. 
In a similar manner, the global art history in its post-colonial sweep rediscovers time and again independent art movements and self-organized cultures of, to connect to our topic, the former East, in example. In the mirror of global contemporaneity, the Eastern independents are often observed as the harbingers of freedom, experiment, innovation, and risk. Art museums, and now I'm coming to the question of representation and specific uh, haptic aspect of representation in the uh, museum context. So art museums throughout, throughout, through their monumental wide spaces are reproducing the second life of the documentation of ephemeral actions, informal happenings, and secret exhibitions over and over again. They monumentalize grain, black and white images of Eastern European art experiment in order to confirm the own fantasy speech for what is invisible, forgotten, non-represented, suppressed, censored, and therefore truly free. So here, speaking about this kind of uh, 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 confirmation of freedom via the other, more or less, this is the same freedom that was imposed, uh, uh, the, the concept of freedom that was created by um, CIA installed Congress of Cultural Freedom in the 20th century. Within this logic, the uh, Eastern uh, European art enters global Western museum not as the traditional piece of excellence which is somehow uh, reserved for uh, the um, so-called neutral Western art which we never call Western but for art, art, artists as such but as a document of dissidence so more or less, whenever we see the object of Eastern European art in the museum, it participates in the narrative of contemporary global museum as document of dissidence. So it appears that artistic freedoms become suddenly all more interesting for contemporary art if being endangered. Therefore, the signifier East standing for the totalitarian communist state and its all-seeing guy that is contemporary that in contemporary imagination surveilled art and culture with impassable attention had to be put forward and put at the center of the stage so this is how we can uh, we can think of this dependence of the very western uh, uh, concept of free the confirmation of individual individual freedoms, but also certain nostalgia for uh, when freedom is endangered. So the existence of totalitarian state. The contemporary art and its self-saturating mechanism of anything goes freedoms almost dreams about such omnipresent gaze of the state or of hegemonous public of the eye that is so tentative about what the free artist or intellectual could or would say, the eye which is always ready to censor and attack the true freedom of speech. This fantasy on endangered freedom entangled with overproduction of criticality in contemporary art that in actuality never reaches its power addressee have uh, led to novel Voltairean twist operative in global post-socialist context. If totalitarian state didn't exist, it should have been invented. Okay, you know, if God uh, didn't exist, it should have been invented, uh, uh, reads the original uh, uh, Voltairean uh, uh, saying. Ideological division of official art versus alternative art is crucial for the contemporary reading of the Eastern European art histories. 
within the dominant discourse of post-socialist global contemporaneity that stands behind the regional history readings, the representation of Eastern European art, especially of neo guards of 60s and 70s, also termed as what you have on this slide, non-conformist and official art, second publicity, underground movement or self-organized alternative, is articulated in two distinct but nevertheless mutually interconnected ways. On one side, the alternative Eastern art represents itself as a part of dissident culture, establishing the narrative about the brave artists as lone voices of rebellion against the totalitarian communist system, as fighters for the basic human right, the right of individuals to freely express themselves. On the other side, in the post-Soviet and post-Yugoslav context, Art is being reparceled into the role of national art histories based on liberating the individual artistic contributions from communist joke and their return under the umbrella of corresponding national cultures, which is part of popular and populist politics, so omnipervasive in the process of consolidation of the newly created nation states in the context of Europe, namely EU. But such imaginary pictures of the past do erase not only the historical complexity and all the contradictions of really existing socialism, but also the entire row of general and specific differences between the countries of the former Eastern Bloc, as well as the singularity of the Yugoslav communist project. This self-inflicted amnesia cell serves to threaten the dominant anti-communist consensus through uniting the seemingly opposed political options such as pro-European democraticism and Eurosceptic ethno-nationalism. By pointing to some aspects of the politics of art and concrete strategies of independence and self-organization in the Eastern European art of the 60s and 70s, I would like to problematize precisely this firm division of the cultural space on the official art and alternative art. So the dividing line that is often to be found as the main epistemological tool of the recent interpretations of cultural histories in the former countries of real socialism. And okay, I see already uh, because I was uh, I was uh, very much uh, in touch uh, in the in the in the in the last years and collaborating with uh, with transit. So and uh, since I'm also insisting on that, I see that. Uh, the discourse is changing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. The division of official and alternative art. So this division is being expressed through the two binary pairs constantly emerging in the studies of Eastern Europe and new art histories of the countries of socialist bloc. The first, the official art, encompasses the concept of authoritarian or, or, or totalitarian, within which socialist realism, Nazi Kunst and fascist art are being observed without the significant mutual ideological differences. And all of this is set in opposition against the various different avant-garde and modernisms that are supposedly creating some normality of free art. And this second binary, which we already problematized today, and uh, 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 which uh, were already being problematized by the exhibition presented in transit uh, in, uh, tra in transit in Bratislava, uh, encircled the concept of official art, alleged allegedly developed according to the dictum of authoritarian state, which is juxtaposed with the concept of alternative art. And alternative art is presented uh, as standing in frontal opposition against the state 
and hides itself at the margins of publicity, in dark spaces of alternative scene, in artists' apartments, or in the wilderness of nature. But after examining the concrete terrain of artistic practices, it becomes clear that it is not possible to express any findings in such oversimplifying and ideologized paradigms and concepts. Alternative art spaces were mostly not secret and isolated, by, but collectively and programmatically created as the spaces of exchange, interna internationalization, and alternative historicization of art, if you want. So, I proposed one formula in regard to interpretation of where, uh, how can we interpret this uh, para-institutional uh, terrain of, in example, Student Cultural Center in Belgrade, but which I think is applicable to many other spaces in former Yugoslavia and former Eastern Europe. Self-organization, institution, self-organization, but seen as a formula. Independence in the East often begins on the doorsteps of state-organized alternative institutions. Again, some kind of paradox, state-organized but alternative institutions in a sense of state-funded, maybe controlled, but maybe not. So, in student and youth cultural centers, in amateur clubs of enthusiasts, in galleries showing young artists and students of art academies. So, my claim is that independence in the East doesn't necessarily appear on remote borders or imaginary outsides of the society, but often act as a critique from within, as a part of the and, uh, and this independence in the East is part of the cultural political uh, bloodstream of the socialist societies. This is my claim, that it is part of it, that it is not alienated and that it is not self-alienating. The example which I often refer to in my previous writings on the contradictions of independent cultures in the countries of really existing socialism was the practice of student cultural center in Belgrade. And uh, uh, this is uh, one of my first like more serious, uh, the image from one of my first more serious interpretations I think written in uh, to 2011 for the, the journal with a very nice uh, name, The Life of Art, I mean appropriate for uh, the topic we are examining today. The Student Cultural Center operated during the 70s as an alternative institution dedicated to experimental art and exhibition practices, social activism and critical intellectual developments. Although established from above, I come to that, by the state and party structures, the Student Cultural Center can be observed as institutional space created in a certain performative mode, as an institution in movement or institution-movement, since it grew out of the student and workers' protests of 1968 and continued that movement from the inside now from the inside of the state funded institution producing the new wave of so social and cultural critique together with international flux of artists intellectuals and activists from above i promise that i will uh, come with phot photography to support uh, to support this claim that Student Cultural Center is established from above because uh, it was result of uh, politic of uh, the political activities of the group of young intellectuals who, who led the protest and uh, also the student union and actually the control over over the building of uh, state security agency. Uh, this uh, kind of heavy, you know, like a state building, uh, which you know, like post-socialist fantasy can make many stories about, 
was uh, and which was also located in, in the center of Belgrade, which also post socialist fantasy in terms of uh, current like uh, city development, this kind of de de developmental uh, thinking uh, uh, would never uh, would never give it actually to students. So it was given to a student union at the very end of the 60s. Uh, after the uh, end of student protest and after uh, Tito, the president Tito, said students are right, like society, uh, society should be revolutionized. So revolution, we live in socialism, but revolution is not, is not over. And then the protesters, the student union, uh, got the, the building. Okay. This is not an unambiguous uh, uh, pro process or gesture. So the uh, 1968 protests in Yugoslavia ended with, with redirecting the students towards the alternative institutionalism with the aim for their critical labor to continue within this newly opened student and youth centers and galleries for young artists. This move uh, was uh, broadly understood in two different ways, both of which could be exemplary, meaning applicable, for many other independent art spaces in uh, the former East. For some of the uh, uh, protagonists of the epoch or art historians dealing with 60s and 70s in Eastern art, the production of independence and alternative institutionalism in the socialist context was a kind of sophisticated state mechanism of control. According to such views, and one of uh, the supporters of such views is uh, Mishko Šuvaković, uh, whom uh, we have seen in this uh, Shampas uh, colony hanging with uh, hippies. Um, the state was appropriating political critique to infrastructurally, that is, institutionally, support the creation of an organized margin or a peripheral social lab in which the emerging critical ideas and practices could be easily exercised, fostered and built upon, but also identified, monitored, isolated and controlled. Contrary to that, and from different perspective, the idea of independence and the concept of alternative institutionalism, okay, you see I'm mentioning this concept of alternative institutionalism, this is also kind of my coin as a, uh, 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 as a reaction to this notion of new uh, institutionalism, but also to support the, the claim that, you know, like definitely, uh, uh, the cultural landscape in Eastern Europe brought many concepts which are super interesting for contemporaneity and that uh, they're being, you know, like just a, a, re a kind of uh, uh, renamed and sort of, you know, like uh, appropriated without maybe uh, crediting uh, uh, the uh, crediting uh, the uh, the uh, histories, okay, that are marginalized, like in example, uh, Eastern European cultural experiment. So, according to this, uh, to this, to this, uh, to this other other view, the, uh, to alternative uh, uh, institutionalism. Uh, whose uh, representative is uh, uh, Dunja Blažević, uh, the person who is uh, maybe the uh, uh, most important for the uh, many, many uh, incredibly important programs that took place in Student Cultural Center, and whom I call uh, socialist, set, uh, so socialist and uh, feminist set Sihilaup. <laughs> Uh, according to her interpretation, uh, this was uh, basically the intervention into the field of institutional, so not the action of the state to create the organized margin, but the intervention into the field of institutional 
and emancipatory practice which used the infrastructure of political movement of 1968 for, in her words, conquering and producing a space of genuine freedom, some kind of temporary or like less temporary because of also infrastructurally supported by state autonomous zone. In other words, this guerrilla approach to alternative institutionalism or long march through institutions opened a way towards a different understanding of our practice and free circulation of critical and political ideas coming from the new generation of artists and intellectuals. The contradictions of state-funded alternative institutions, so maybe this is, uh, this is uh, the most uh, precise description of uh, what I refer to under, uh, alter, uh, alternative, under the term of alternative institutionalism. So the contradictions of state-funded alternative institutions can also be researched through the numerous cases of galleries and cultural youth centers all over the former East. Besides the student centers in Belgrade and Zagreb, some of the uh, examples of such practice can be found in uh, Foxhall Gallery Warsaw, uh, then uh, Galeria Mladih, did I say it right? In Bratislava, the Gallery of Art Academy in Latvia, Club of Young Artists in Budapest, Tribina Mladih in Novi Sad and many others. And in this uh, list or in this comparison, I mean uh, like uh, uh, the comparison is based on a structurally, organizationally similar situation, but not necessarily the same lived experience. So each case is singular in its context, its program and its social impact, but in the light of contemporary post-socialist reading of critical art practices in the Eastern Bloc, it is important to emphasize that the state infrastructure also assumes support for the production of artistic and intellectual critique. Many of those young art-oriented institutions had double status. They function simultaneously as both state institutions of culture and the sites of spontaneous, occasionally subversive gatherings of heterogeneous communities of artists, intellectuals, and political activists. These independent institutions usually operated in a non-hierarchical manner, rejecting the traditional disciplines and professional divisions of labor, as well as illusionistic separation of the cultural producers from the audience or consumers, which was a kind of spontaneous rejection of the classical institutionalized form of curating in Yugoslav context, okay, I think, I mean, more or less worldwide, uh, the very word uh, like uh, curating in a sense of independent curating didn't exist at the time. Uh, okay, we know somehow we generate uh, it uh, in this kind of global <laughs> uh, from the uh, uh, term Ausstellungmacher, exhibition maker. But uh, I also think uh, that uh, this uh, uh, person, uh, uh, actually two persons whom I call uh, like uh, Yugoslav feminist uh, Seth Sihelov and Yugoslav feminist Harold Zemer, so Dunja Blažević and uh, Biljana Tomić also offered an interesting term for curating which is applied criticism. So, uh, instead of institutionalized forms of curating, here we, uh, here we were encountering uh, um, some kind of rather collective engagement of artists and critics, colla collaborating with various communities of similarly minded young people or uh, subcultural groups. This also assumed rethinking the form of the form of institution, the form of exhibition, the form of artwork, and the form of art community. 
So, in other words, this assumed, politicized approach to exhibition structures and event cultures. The idea of a performative institution or the uh, institution, inst uh -huh. Um, okay, it can stay. The idea of performative institution or institution in movement may be taken as a designation for much of the independent cultures in the East. Such an institutional form represents departure from the classical national welfare state institutions viewed as expression of power and guardian of the canon. Performativity would in this case mean surpassing all those dualisms of movement-institution or self-organization-institution or critique-institution. Performativity emerged here as the very substance that eroded the firmness of the walls, the enclosure, the isolation and self-sufficiency of classical institutional venue in regard to everyday life and sociality from below. So I think it's also like very interesting within a, the, uh, the within the context of uh, uh, not only um, uh, state and uh, institutional infrastructure of really existing socialism, but of the state and institutional infrastructure of really existing socialism enabling. Uh, a really genuine communist thinking. Is it on a full screen? Okay. Uh, how are we, Zuzha, uh, with time? Ten minutes, okay. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, uh, I, I'm always uh, like talking more longer than, um, than I want. So, okay, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, cut myself in one, in one moment because, uh, because I think that uh, we can, you know, like fant fantasize uh, further, further some things and I will go quickly through the, through the slide. So, uh, another thing that I wanted to point to, this is like this independence uh, and performative institutionalism as the uh, form or as uh, the infrastructure for collective learning, for uh, what is being referred to as alternative universities and for the form of altered self-historicization, even exhibition histories, if you will. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I hear, I hear, I hear the, I hear the crowd speaks. Shall we, shall we cut? Shall we cut it here? Shall we, shall we, uh, shall we rather discuss with each other? What should we do? What do you say, Zuzha, as organizer? Because I don't know. Like I'm feeling the, 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 the I'm feeling the chatty, the chatty pulse of. Uh, of our audience, so I don't want to, you know, like play boring totalitarian. I think that's very interesting um, to, anyway, so I think it would be great to get to the current situation in which these concepts are uh, mm -hmm. deciphered and embedded in a very different system. Because uh, this reveals a lot of our motivation why we really need to come back to this time to understand. Uh, because we, we experiment, we experiment, experience like the concept of independence and self-organization from uh, backwards. So we we first encounter it in our present situation, and then we we trace them back. Yeah, history, and that's why I, I 
I think it would make sense to, to kind of round to, up to, your, to your the, lecture to come to evening. Yes, okay, to, to come to come to the contemporary moment, but uh, just a, just a little just a little footnote. I also think that uh, uh, maybe the, 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 the competition under the postmarks of uh, uh, art histories and exhibition histories that um, Lucy, Lucy pointed to is part of rather uh, representation of the field and kind of expert culture. I think that the, the things are very much entangled and that also in a way, okay, uh, although there is a such thing as art history, uh, today we also speak about art histories and we speak about this kind of also performative writing back from, from contemporary situation, maybe. I don't know if it makes sense in your, in your, in your, um, uh, in your experience and also in regard to, to, to what you wanted to, uh, to, to point to. Okay, just quickly, just just to quickly go uh, go, go through slides. In example, in example, uh, they, they, we, we see here for the first time this uh, like uh, in in the context of this alternative institutionalism, in this establishment uh, of the links between the avant-garde, like historical avant-garde, and neo-avant-garde. I don't know why that doesn't work. Uh, uh, one, uh, yeah. Arpur Research Center in Budapest in 1978 uh, was uh, dealing with uh, the field that we, that we call exhibition histories, introduction of the feminist issue, 78 first uh, conference on uh, uh, feminism that, uh, uh, that took place outside of a Western context and took place in, uh, in Belgrade's Union Cultural Center. Then uh, I, I wanted to talk, but I can also send text to those of you who are interested about this interna international spirit of uh, such art, because uh, as difference from national welfare state institutions, who were kind of focused to uh, like national uh, artists, great artists, grand artists, figures, uh, this field of independent of alternative cultures was very much about the notion of international and about the networks of solidarity, friendships, and curiosity. East, West, East, East, plus, plus, etc., etc. And one of such uh, places was April Meetings, uh, Festival of Extended Me Media in Belgrade. I lost uh, uh, image, okay, uh, the exhibition Flux of Seas that we're showing. Uh, that was showing things then, uh, the exhibition that was mentioned uh, today uh, taking place in Galentine Chapel studio, the exhibition of men and women in uh, uh, Zagreb, then uh, also as one of the characteristics of this independent scene uh, is uh, what they call art uh, and life or life of art outside of the gallery, but focusing on the meetings no matter whether these were studios, apartments, urban or natural, but also observing these spaces, not as the spaces of escape, but as the spaces uh, uh, in which this fleeing, this uh, escape, was the product of uh, active relations so of, a certain, of a certain activity, in an exhibition in a cafe, uh, the artists were opening their studios for public act activities. Uh, Daniel, you recognize the image. And uh, also Podrum Gallery, Sanya Iveku is Dalibor Martinez opening, uh, opening their space. Interesting quote from uh, uh, Mladen, Mladen Stilinovic also about the referring to the culture of these alternative alternative spaces and referring to the gatherings in Podrum Gallery in Zagreb, which was uh, the studio of Sanya Ivekovic and, Dan and uh, uh, Daniel Martinez. He said, I work in Podrum because I'm responsible for what I do. When we act through other galleries or newspapers, 
uh, it is them and not me who think they are responsible for my work that bothers me and it cannot be true. Besides, I like that my work is being presented completely, that is exactly the way I envision it from the poster and the catalog to duration of the exhibition and how the works are stored. I really liked the sentence by Aretino, the one that says, to be alive means never going to the court. When I go to other institutions, I feel like going to the court. When I go to Podrum, I go to Podrum. And we come to, uh, to actually contemporary question. So, uh, which is uh, the question of professionalization of independence, and which is about the self-organized uh, contemporaneity uh, and uh, a bit rephrase of uh, Frederick Jameson, so the cultural logic of latest capitalism. In the global post-socialist context, the very idea of independent cultural scene triggers numerous kind, kinds of uneasiness in ideological and economic sense. Some are implied by the very name, independent. But a lot of this uneasiness stems from the ongoing discrepancies between the nominal and actual positioning in the wider space of culture. Nominal and actual, under nominal and actual, I assumed the statement, the utterance, la la, nominal, and actual is uh, the, how the apparatus of production is being reorganized, retold, new proposals, like actuality of existence, of uh, existence, of living, of connections between the people, because in contemporary exhibitions, we, you know, like, uh, here, uh, curators, you know, like who, who uh, you know, like uh, deal with these uh, uh, obligatory capitalist uh, rhetorics. Uh, so, like uh, ticking the boxes of uh, uh, Spivak, uh, Agamben, uh, Tick, uh, etc., etc., and then making uh, the exhibition, which is a uh, super colonial uh, product. So, nominal and actual. Cultural systems of the countries of former East as well as those of former West are today characterized by retrograde process of renationalization of cultures on one hand and introductions of the mar market principles of, on the other, <coughs> which also results with ever growing numbers of free actors without permanent employment. Such tendencies are becoming intensified, especially in the geopolitical space of Eastern Europe, with the establishment of democratic, I really have to insist on that uh, 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 like, quote marks. So, with the establishment of democratic post-socialist regimes and their transitionalist uh, economic and social restructuring. This restructuring meant a gentle request to institutions to enter the market and become self-sustainable. Of course, self-sustainability here mostly meant accepting this or that model of private-public partnership or complete privatization of the former public sphere. So institutions that uh, previously were in their funding and mission wholly public are falling into the schism of double standards. On the one hand, maintaining a tight connection with the state produces the pressure to perform in terms of national cultural programs and their prerogatives. On the other hand, their increasingly liberalized or flexible relations with the state necessarily produce another kind of institution the institution of self-organized actors within the contemporary field of culture. The result of such constellation is that the contemporary field of culture and education, especially in the sphere of the so-called content production, is mainly inhabited by the independent and often, individu and often individual actors who are expected to be invested in economical self reinvention, meaning either the reinvention by positioning in the field of cultural industries or by entering the system of project management. 
projectization in the context of EU or opportunism, the culture of opportunities that uh, some of the writers of uh, mesosphere, mesosphere or Mesosphera journal uh, place emphasis on. The post-socialist transitionalism and professionalization of uh, independence in the East is financially and administratively connected with the process of European integration and corporate safety walls for social responsibility. In the contemporary event culture, the very notion of institution and its firmness, power and durability changes as the contemporary forms are always temporary, including contemporary institutionalism. Locally, but also globally, the questions of self-organization and independence gain ever new relevance framed as they are by the disappearance of the welfare state or socialist institution of public good. This retreat of social state is gaining, is going in parallel with the expansion of individual entrepreneurships, the process which is currently unfolding at an ever faster pace. In the region of former East, but also within the global post-socialist context, the majority of cultural workers active today, locally and internationally, are choosing or are uh, are being compelled to adopt self-organized forms of existence, acting through small collectives, troops, groups, and alternative education projects. They're compelled to act as alternative cultural scene as the so-called independent initiatives. Self-organization and independence today assumes growingly flexible and precarious working conditions as well as mobile and adaptable forms of cognitive and body survivalism not so distant from the Darwinist representation of the natural world in which the only fittest survive. The contemporary free actors whose freedom is of course very much conditional, still tend to ground their position of relative independence through this identification with the national state institution, traditional professionalist division of labor and hierarchical structures of cooperation. But at the same time, some of these independent cultural actors, especially those who are coming who are continuing the histories of Eastern neo-avant-garde, are also restoring the interest in the artistic working process and the political economy of art, re-thematizing cultural labor and working practice, and creating new spaces that express the tendency to be more public, more democratic, and more collectivist. <laughs> Possible? Sure. So the transition from really existing socialism taken as a social ground of operation from the 60s and 70s, as uh, I discussed it today, to liberal democracy and free market economy, that is really existing capitalism, can be also seen as the ultimate victory of self-organization and oppressive self-care. It is transition from childish immaturity, so the moment when the state takes care of you to full maturity and taking the sole responsibility for one's own beliefs and actions, life and work. So, uh, it is uh, uh, what I'm speaking about now is also very much, very much, very much personal because uh, I, 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 I select uh, and I'm kind of compelled to play as a kind of karaoke. Uh, businessman in contemporary funky art capitalism. <laughs> Thanks a lot for exposing you, <laughs> your secret plot. <laughs> So, uh, I would like to uh, invite Daniel and Mira, uh, Daniel Grun and Mira Kratova to, to the table. And in the meanwhile, they are coming here. I also would like to collect quickly some questions that uh, uh, will be incorporated in this uh, rather short round table that uh, aims to create a dialogue between all these many uh, interesting thoughts that we heard. 
Um, so uh, please be very agile and uh, straightforward and uh, sign if you have questions or comments. Hmm? Now here's really the time to, to interact with, with us and uh, <laughs> with the topics. No one so far? Okay, um, where's Mira? Oh, lucky. Ah. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, Mira is here, great. Uh, so I can introduce Daniel, uh, who is uh, assistant professor at uh, the Bratislava Academy of Arts. Uh, and he wrote his PhD thesis, uh, uh, um, the title translated to English is The Archaeology of Art and Criticism. And he is an expert of Slovak conceptual art and East European art histories, and also co curator of the current Julius Kohler show in Vienna, Mumok, that is recommended to everyone here. Uh, and I also introduce Mira Karatova, who is art historian and curator as well. And uh, um, um, she organized very important uh, exhibitions of uh, very important Bratislava artists like Peter Bartos here. Lubomir Durček also featured in the Sitting Together exhibition as, a, as well as Tano Filko. And uh, most importantly, she worked a lot and created interesting projects out of Jan Budai's archive and activities. And now you are working on a show by Stano Filko that is going upcoming in uh, Banska Bistrica next week. On Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay, so please come. <laughs> Unfortunately, we, we don't have so much time because we have to finish at quarter to eight, as I learned. So uh, we have to be very straightforward and uh, <laughs> to the point. So please, Lucy and Jelena, come. But maybe they can speak more. But please sit together. <laughs> no, but this is all right. So the idea was here to, to gather uh, all these uh, uh, expertises uh, so that to uh, answer the question uh, how we can uh, talk and work with the art of our region, uh, including uh, uh, art events uh, that were realized uh, during the Cold War era, or realized in the so-called former West, uh, uh, where uh, most of us here uh, are based in. And uh, I have to, to say that uh, this is uh, uh, a question that is not uh, uh, raised um, as a kind of scientific question, self-evident one, but it's more uh, coming from the experience that uh, uh, studying art history and contemporary art, uh, uh, I think most of us realize that uh, there are really uh, uh, topics that are very uh, dif difficult to access, and uh, whereas there's a, a very strong uh, internationality of contemporary art, uh, uh, still, uh, I think it's, it's very important to keep asking the question why why we are doing or working or researching a certain topic and what's our position uh, in it. And uh, I think it it's also connects interestingly to the debate between art history and exhibition uh, histories. Uh, in, in my understanding, uh, it's very important to realize that in exhibition histories we are talking about a collective effort which has many factors within which art is just one, or the artists and the creators and that's the institution, the state, the economics and, uh, and a lot of other factors uh, uh, which, uh, different, which are different uh, uh, in, in, uh, so which, which, which have uh, Mm, significant differences in different uh, mm, historical and uh, geographical con uh, positions and conditions. Sorry. 
So, uh, what I think would be the most productive if uh, Daniel and Mira could reflect on what we've heard so far and uh, also this general question how we can uh, um, uh, deal with uh, 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 this idea of East European art, whether we should reject it, whether we can leave it behind, what other uh, concepts or strategies can be used. So, um, okay, um, I have maybe just two short reflections. Um, um, I, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, a situation now like that we have uh, uh, two presentations on quite different topics, but uh, what, uh, what, what uh, is the uh, the common ground uh, is uh, is actually um, the question how uh, he, uh, who, uh, the question of representation uh, who and uh, and how uh, is representing uh, certain uh, sex, certain exhibition history and uh, I think that uh, like the 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 main, uh, like the, the title actually of this this evening, like how we speak about uh, about uh, Eastern European exhibitions, is a question of language. Like the, we are asking about the language we use uh, to, uh, to to talk about uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, uh, actually, I uh, what I um, uh, what I uh, I think is. Uh, is most productive uh, behind the concept of Eastern Europe is uh, is a transnationality, the, the notion that uh, uh, that Lucy uh, has uh, uh, strength, uh, strengthens, strengthened, and uh, uh, the, tra the transnationality is maybe one of the. Uh, the most uh, productive, actually, I see it as a, one of the most productive challenges behind this concept. Uh, as uh, uh, nowadays, uh, yeah, this, this concept could be, the, the concept or construction of Eastern Europe could be problematized from many, uh, many corners, uh, many aspects, and even we could, we could say that it's, uh, it's a wrong concept. Uh, and, uh, but but what, what I think is the, the uh, uh, the strongest uh, behind the strongest uh, uh, notion behind is transnationality, and uh, the, then uh, the question of uh, uh, language. I come back to the question of not, uh, language, and this is what uh, what um, uh, Yelena uh, was talking about, and I think I what for me. What was uh, in her uh, talk uh, the most striking is uh, how we can all overcome this binary uh, binary thinking on Eastern Europe, uh, this binary thinking which uh, somehow uh, situate us in uh, in this in uh, in these opposites uh, uh, oppos uh, opposites like uh, official unofficial uh, uh, and. And all these east-west uh, and all these uh, oppositions, which which are somehow uh, uh, stereotyped uh, and uh, are, are functioning as, as a st uh, stereotype. So that there, uh, I think that we, we need to think uh, beyond uh, uh, this, this, this binary uh, this, this binary uh, oppositions and uh, search for um, certain ways how to how to go go out and. Um, yeah, um, uh, my question uh, in relation to both, uh, to both uh, actually to both uh, uh, talks is uh, whether we can, it's, it's quite a simple question, like whether we can measure uh, freedom, whether, whether we can measure uh, the level of freedom and uh, because uh, I'm asking this question because uh, 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 concerning for example uh, a students, uh, students club in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Belgrade uh, or uh, other uh, alternative.
collective or, or self-organized institutions within uh, former Eastern Bloc, uh, the, the, the level of criticality and possibility to be critical uh, is, uh, is different in each case. And it's a very complex question. It's a very complex question. And uh, uh, when, uh, the, my question is whether it, it's always uh, dependent on a certain political situation. Like talking about Galeria Mladich in Bratislava, we can talk about this, this uh, gallery only be before 1972. Uh, uh, after that, the, 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 all these possibilities were, were uh, simply uh, over. Uh, so I would say like the 60s in Czechoslovakia uh, was more progressive than, than for example 60s in, uh, in Hungary and then for example 80s in, uh, or 70s in, in, uh, in uh, Yugoslavia uh, are much different than 70s in Czechoslovakia and then 80s, uh, uh, what Lucy was uh, mentioned this anti-show book like the late 80s in the uh, in, uh, Soviet Union or in, Ra in Soviet Union or in particularly in Moscow, uh, were much more free, actually, than the, uh, the situation in, in, uh, in uh, Bratislava or Prague. So, uh, so this is the question uh, of, uh, uh, of um, um, how we are related to this, this, uh, 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 this institution or institutions or para-institutions uh, within the, the certain political, uh, political um, uh, um, yeah, political, uh, historical uh, situation and date, yeah. And uh, this is the first thing. And uh, the second, uh, the second uh, question, uh, um, um, yeah, maybe I I I I, uh, I think more about the second question because I uh, I have I'm sorry I have difficulty to uh, to formulate my my questions uh, clearly. So I now pass my uh, the microphone to Mira and maybe I can do a little bit more. And, yeah. It's working. And then well, how we do it? How we do it? Like first we collect our questions and then you you answer or maybe I don't know what's the better okay. maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I actually, uh, in fact, I don't really know uh, where, where to, what shall I tell, in fact, because there are a lot of things which were opened by those lectures, now by Daniel referring also to them, and so it's a lot of things what could be told, but like um, if we try to keep certain focus, as it was uh, announced at the, I guess, the headline of the of this talk or meeting, uh, and as you posed this question at the beginning about Eastern European art, so I would come back to that then. So in my understanding, like put it very, very roughly now, not really uh, uh, very precisely, but uh, in my understanding, a development of this term uh, is, uh, I would, I would ra rather I would relate the, or rather name it sort of self-colonization. You know, it's like starting even already in uh, with, in 60s, 70s, where diverse artists were taking over terms like conceptual art from Western discourse, and then by appropriating it, putting it to own unique, even very, very different context. And uh, so, uh, and uh, later on in. 90s after the fall of the wall and so on, uh, then, uh, uh, then this kind of, then there was the situation where the reconstruction of uh, Eastern European art history was launched, but there was not existing any theoretical apparatus, there was nothing, you know, by hand, so it was taken over again from the West, so this self-colonization started on a theoretical level, not by artists themselves already, but it was a sort of another wave. And then there was, uh, uh, I had the impression there was such period around the year 2000 where there were several exhibitions like uh, what comes up to my mind, for example, Manifesta in Ljubljana, I think it was whatever, 2002 maybe or what, where there was, so there was such atmosphere 
against this kind of post-colonial exotization of Eastern Europe, very much like that, let's end it. But it was, uh, I, I know, it, it's like, of course, it's like the beginning is certain superiority, certain domi economical dominance, uh, uh, cultural evolution, like in a far, like, the more developed cultural evolution, let's say, in the West and so on, but like at the end it was, you know, adopted very well, or people adopted it by themselves, but if you can speak about it like that. So, so there was this kind of certain revolt period and then, but then later on, again, this Eastern Europe was taken over by whomever, Boris Groys and so on, Piotrowski, whatever, other, other, uh, people as a sort of because there needs to be some kind of created some kind of framework which would explain the special condition of communistic era in which the artists were working and then not only that also special condition of transformation period where in which already in that time contemporary artists were working so this uh, geopolitical framework somehow uh, was uh, used to determine uh, or to yeah to determine or, ex or take this this part from from this universal art history western art history so this is the eastern special thing eastern european art and then it goes on by now and uh, another thing is speaking about then contemporary art there by this massive reconstruction of historical art and the research of historical art of uh, the socialistic period, it was it very much influenced contemporary art. It's aesthetic, concept aesthetically, conceptually, until nowadays, even now it's not already this peak of this kind of influence, but whatever, even until now, uh, artists in this Eastern European region are dealing at least, if nothing else, at least with sentiment, uh, certain sentiment of for modernist utopias and so on. It's very touching or, you know, appealing until nowadays. Even it goes like uh, this intensity is lowering. And uh, so uh, now I a bit lose the line. So, uh, so somehow uh, this is this is some kind of development, and now maybe we are reaching this point where uh, this contemporary art nowadays uh, is not doesn't need to be necessarily related to this tradition which was already not recreated. Let's say uh, it can function, you know, it can be like from elsewhere, and this this uh, term is not. Uh, not needed anymore so much, let's say. So maybe therefore we are sitting here now how to, uh, how to deal with it farther or, yeah, so, yeah, so this was just such a sort of flashback. Thank you. So I think it would be great if you could react and uh, uh, also, please uh, feel free to, to uh, ask questions also at this point, if you have any. Uh, but I think it, it's, uh, it's really um, uh, important uh, to, to ask if uh, we can abandon these regional categories, then uh, what other problems are faced? If, is it really accessible? Um, uh, for us to, to research, uh, uh, for instance, Asian art, or for whom it is accessible, or, for, or, or who is compa competent uh, enough uh, uh, going uh, very far away from uh, his or her own context. And if, if it exists at all, so I think these are important dilemmas also um, when um, uh, uh, we think of the categories uh, uh, um, described by Jelena, how these are uh, uh, recycled in these uh, neo-capitalist societies of, uh, of uh, these free-moving agents uh, uh, designed after uh, the dissident artists. And uh, uh, um, I think uh, 
the transnational, uh, the idea of transnationality is is also much connected to this uh, kind of uh, individual actors. Uh, whereas I think it's uh, also um, important to consider. Uh, um, if uh, representation is always something bad and uh, if uh, um, really this, this kind of individualism uh, uh, which means that uh, artists can be disconnected and uh, artistic practice can be meaningful anywhere in the world uh, um, is, is valid uh, um, in, in uh, uh, for instance, situations where there's a huge social crisis and uh, when, uh, um, uh, for instance, artworks uh, 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 gain uh, very different meanings in, in different places, in the case of, for instance, traveling exhibitions. Um, so, if you can continue uh, from here, that's great, and if not, then... <laughs> Uh, uh, feel free to come back to your. <laughs> okay, just uh, just just short uh, to uh, uh, the the questions of uh, uh, Daniel and Mira. Uh, I think uh, I think in a way uh, with posing uh, with posing this question about uh, okay although. Uh, Although I think the very question is uh, maybe problematic, how do we measure freedom? I think you gave a great answer to it, uh, uh, which is uh, totally outside of the uh, quantification of freedom, which cannot be quantified except for, you know, like uh, in filling the, 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 the questionnaires of foundations, etc. So, uh, uh, I think uh, I think you know like the, this this uh, this uh, comparative uh, this comparative field which points to similarities and differences which points to uh, to, to context and decontextualization so kind of uh, non simultaneity contextualization and contextualization in space and time is uh, 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 one of uh, is a good is 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 I think uh, very is uh, our historical thinking that can lead us uh, to uh, some kind of truth of what is in art. But on the other hand, I don't. Uh, uh, I think that you know, like uh, uh, to return to this uh, uh, question of self colonization. I think that whenever we mention freedom. Uh, it is uh, like this kind of like very colonizing freedom, which uh, to which historical source source I pointed to mention this Congress for Cultural Freedom. So you know, like uh, 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 it is uh, not the case that the only freedom we can think of is uh, uh, the freedom of uh, capitalist uh, liberal democracy that is you know like individual freedom. So uh, there are different different freedoms which, which we can which we can uh, think of and uh, and consider. And then uh, I also I also think, uh, yeah so like the very notion of freedom whenever we pose it that that way we I think conform ourselves to the uh, Western canon. Uh, for which we say, okay, it does not exist any longer. In a way, it does not exist, but it actually exists. So maybe you know, like it exists in a, a, the reflection of periphery, if not in the other center. Because now it, is, it seems that you know, like the center is so much interested in peripheries. Because uh, to return to what uh, Zuzha was talking about, who can speak about what? Of course, uh, the, uh, good co uh, I mean, good colonizers. Only good colonizers, so rich and with a colonial experience. So, uh, it's also an interesting term, good colonizer. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, okay, I, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, and the the the, the, uh, the last uh, I think that uh, uh, in regard to what you to what you said to what you said I, I don't uh, agree with uh, I don't agree with uh, uh, 
uh, your claim that uh, uh, the uh, art historical uh, terminology uh, and I mean uh, like this exhibition terminology have been uh, uh, have been just you know like uh, uncritically uh, imported and I think that uh, there was also di difficulty in construction of uh, which terms we use in uh, is uh, like more more expanding, more like rich, uh, uh, you know, like uh, so, so societies. I think there were also a lot of dilemma and proliferation of different terms. But I also think, uh, and I think, and I think that what I spoke about uh, today, what I tried to do actually, and uh, what's maybe this tiny layer of contribution with uh, uh, with uh, uh, my today's presentation, is precisely the attempt to decolonize. Uh, to decolonize the terms, to actually show some uh, uh, that, that uh, within the context of what we refer to as Eastern art, uh, it is not, you know, like they just, uh, you know, like uh, 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 East, uh, like uh, a certain lack, lack of something, like a woman is lacking penis, so Eastern Europe is lacking mama and is lacking like uh, heavy apparatus of blood. No. So I meant, I meant that in this another wave, it was on contrary to create advantage of this uh, being special, being you know exotized. I meant as I was. Open identification. Mean, uh, no, 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 no. I no, I don't think it's like unconscious thing. Rather, it's like conscious to create. You know that. Uh, to make it okay, like there was okay. What is common? is that there was certain condition which let's say we can speak what was common and then based on it but of course then in detail it's very different yeah well if you speak about soviet union and 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 even if you would speak now in moscow about uh this term i don't i think a lot of people would be in my experience opening eyes that they don't feel uh, to be identified with the rest of the region, with Central Europe, and so. Uh... Um, yeah, because we, we unfortunately don't have uh, really time left, I think it would be great if we could also react on what she finds important, and then we could go micro scale, which is, I think, the solution for all these problems, and uh, continue discussion informally. Uh, and uh, I, I also propose it as a solution for, for this Eastern Europe problem as well, that, uh, to look for um, kind of a, what we use, the, uh, try to introduce the term mesosphere, uh, in which we don't have an outside point of view, but try to kind of uh, connect very different actors and, and uh, create a network uh, without any kind of general label for this. Oh, please. <laughs> I'll speak very quickly. Um, in response to the question, can we measure freedom? I was, I was, I think my equivalent question is, can we generalize freedom? Or, so I was thinking about the French use of liber, li, liberty as one of the three sort of values. The, the implication that they were universal. The fact is they were all put in France. So this is what would be my. Um, it, it, it's about freedom from, from, from where. Um, in terms of, I just wanted to make a small point, Daniel, that uh, APTA was shut down several times, but we are trying not to set it up as a dissident initiative for exactly the reasons that some of you have identified. So we're trying to sit in parallel um, and outside, which I'm going to have to think about whether that's the exercise on the basis of today, but it certainly wasn't. Um, there were, there was a lack of freedom as well in Moscow. Um, in, on the issue of transnationalism in Eastern Europe, I like the idea that that be, might be useful. I, just, I guess my question is, and where does that leave nationalism? If you understand transnationalism as basically ignoring or circumventing the nation state, what about resurgent nationalism? And isn't that an issue um, that we are facing um, across Europe? Uh, and then a final point, you raise representation and language, and I wonder whether translation is there as a mediating issue to think about. To think about. But that's something I have to say. Let's go micro. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and I'm really sorry for this time pressure, but uh, I would be really glad if I could stay and continue discussion.
room so we can continue there. <laughs> so please, please uh, keep with us. Thank you, Alana. Thank you.